there's one important rule for this webinar, the most important rule, and that's get the photos off of your phone. I have about 4,000 images on my phone. What I did was I created a Lightroom catalog specifically for my uh, mobile photography. And every month or so, I'll just offload them. So all of those images um, are on, in my Lightroom catalog. And what that means is I have now access to all the tools that Lightroom uh, and subsequently the plugins and other products that attach to Lightroom offer. Um, so if you don't really take the um, images off your phone, you don't have access to the tools. And so I was sitting here and I was thinking about it. Um, you know, what are the, you know, differences, you know, for those of you that are, are um, iPhone users or uh, even Android users or um, I believe even Palm OS users, um, you can do editing on your phone. There is no shortage of um, applications that developers have put out specifically for your phones. Um, and so it's a matter of, and there's also no uh, shortage of ways to share these images with, you know, your followers, the people that you influence, your family and your friends. So I kind of thought about it and I'm like, all right, well, what are the pros and cons between uh, editing on a phone and editing on a computer? Well, with a phone, um, you have accessibility. So really you can take your image uh, with your phone and start editing it right away. And it's a quick solution because um, a lot of times you can just take, you can go into the editing product and take your picture right there and then, uh, or you can take a bunch of pictures with the camera apps and then load them into the editing software and work on them. And it's inexpensive. Usually anywhere from 99 cents, maybe two or three bucks for a product. And there's a wide variety of products. There's a product that will do panoramic images for you. It'll stitch the images on the fly. There are HDR images for the phones, which are actually not that bad. Um, and then there are also uh, editing softwares like uh, Adobe put out a free version of Photoshop. It's, it's, it's limited, but you know, you can do some basic editing there. Um, so the negatives are it is limited in functionality. So depending on uh, what the developer included, the, depending on if it's Apple, Apple it can be somewhat uh, tight in what it allows developers to build into its products. Um, sometimes the quality can degrade the image. So unsuspecting to you, there are applications, there are products out there that when you save the image, you bring the image into the pro into the application to edit. When you save it, sometimes in the settings, the default setting is to save a low res copy of the image. You might not realize that. And so that can degrade the quality of the image. So you, if you're going to do this, you want to make sure that um, the product has an option to save the you know, highest resolution possible uh, and, and just use that. And then finally, the lack of final control of fine controls. So there are some uh, you know, controls that, or, or tools that uh, you can't get on a mobile phone. And that's just the way it is. But the point of this webinar is to show you actually what you can do with Photoshop. You know, you might think that it's overkill to use the perfect photo suite um, to work on a, on a mobile phone image. But, you know, I'm actually really happy with what we can do here. Now, on a computer, obviously, you've got powerful tools. Between Photoshop, Lightroom, the perfect photo suite, and all the other products out there, you've got, you know, every tool that you would use on a 21 megapixel image here on this little, you know, iPhone, the iPhone 4 is a 5 megapixel camera on a, on a tiny, tiny little sensor. Um, you get greater quality control. So obviously you have a fleet of uh, tools and plugins to uh, fix some of the inherent uh, byproducts of mobile phone photography. And to that point also you can address phone limitations. So mobile phone, as you'll see soon, uh, mobile phone images are riddled with noise. That's just the way it is especially if you try to do some editing on the phone, it, it adds even more noise. Uh, it can be expensive, uh, editing on a computer, Photoshop, Adobe Photoshop um, Extended Edition, I believe retails for $1,000, so that's pricey, Lightroom is 300 bucks, the perfect photo suite, you know, retails at 500, um, but you can oftentimes get it at a discount, but still, you know, if you don't already have it, you ha it's kind of a barrier to entry there. You need a computer, so uh, working on a mobile phone, as long as you've got your phone and you download the app for a dollar or two, you can work on it. On a com you, you know, for Photoshop, you need a computer, a Mac, or a PC. And then there's also a learning curve, um, which is kind of where these webinars come into play. 
my my job, my goal is I want to kind of reduce that learning curve, so that if you meet the the, the qualifications before you already ha you have the products, you have Photoshop, you have the suite, um, you have a computer, obviously. Um, let's learn how to use these tools. So with that, let's let's actually get into the the meat and potatoes, as it were, of um, this mobile phone photography. So I, I created a Lightroom plugin, or a, sorry, a Lightroom catalog rather of these uh, some images, and we'll work on them. And this will be very reminiscent of um, our other webinars. We're going to work on the products using various tools of the Perfect Photo Suite. We'll use tools in Photoshop to get a look. So the re the the images here. So out of the whatever four thousand or so images I selected, I tried to select images that are most. I guess most representative or most common that most people would take. Nothing special, nothing uh, utterly creative. Um, not to say that most people aren't creative, but I didn't want to bias already and, and slant the, the images to something that um, uh, uh, and the average person wouldn't necessarily take. By being able to kind of make these images as relatable as possible, I, I think it'll infuse even more ideas. So this image here, I took this image uh, a couple weeks ago. I was in New York City, and I was actually uh, working out of my friend's production studio in Manhattan. Uh, we actually did one of our webinars from his studio. And I, I, I kind of leaned out of his window. He was on the, I think, the seventh or twelfth floor, I can't remember. And I shot this, it was just a basic shot of a sidewalk in Manhattan, and I was waiting for some pedestrians to walk by, specifically kind of over here and over here. And the reason why I did this was because this is an ideal vantage point to simulate a tilt shift lens look, specifically that miniature toy model look that we've, you know, we've kind of accomplished in the past with focal point. Nothing special here. I just took this image here. I always love looking at the EXIF information that the iPhone reports. Like apparently this was shot in ISO 80, which is pretty fantastic. But there's no chance that this was an ISO 80. Um, it was shot with a 3.85 millimeter lens at an aperture of f2.8 at 1 17th of a second. So 3.85 millimeters is um, insanely wide, but clearly this is not. So it's just funny to look at that stuff sometimes. So what we're going to do is we're going to send this image into Photoshop. Um, now, our products work in Lightroom. They work in Aperture, and they work in Photoshop. I like working out of Photoshop because um, I'm partial to um, getting the uh, workflow, a layered workflow. Now, when we release perfect layers, uh, which will be very soon actually, um, I'll have a layered workflow straight out of Lightroom and I won't even need to use Photoshop. So I'm excited for that as well. The first thing that I'm going to want to do is let's actually work on focal point to give the, these people a toy model look. So I'm going to take this image and I'm just going to go into focal point over here. And I'm going to reset our settings. So if you go to edit and then reset all, it resets focal point to kind of the, the factory defaults. It brings the focus bug into a, a, the round shape. So the focus bug here is the kind of little critter, the little heart and soul of focal point. Anywhere you put the bug, um, inside, inside the confines of the bug, uh, you'll have focus and anything outside will be out of focus. And you can you know, adjust the size and the shape and the orientation of the bug by tugging at these legs over here. But I don't want a circular shape. What I want is a planar shape. So if I go here to the top right of my image and I change my shape from uh, round to planar, you'll see that the body went from a, a circle to a square. And now what I can do is I can adjust the orientation so that it's kind of uh, parallel to the sidewalk. I'm going to position the um, bug kind of over the people here. Now we're going to do a few things. The first thing that I'm going to do is I want to change the kind of plane of focus for the focus bug. And this is important. To do this, you have to have your cursor in the body of the bug. So here's the body. The cursor is inside the body. If I press and hold on the Option key on a Mac or the Alt key on a PC, you'll see how it changes from, by default, the unit that comes up, uh, it'll show the pixels of the mask. But if I press Option or Alt, it changes it to this blur tilt. And so what I'm going to do is, while the cursor is in the body and I'm holding on the Option key or the Alt key, I'm going to shift up. 
And so you can see how the plane is changing. And I'm going to try to make the plane parallel to the um, surface. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop the feathering because I won't want a, a less of a transition from in focus to out of focus. Because there is kind of a fine line. My, my plane of focus is this sidewalk here. And so I'm going to adjust the positioning and then I'm going to adjust the amount of blur. I'm going to drop it down a bit because I don't want that much blur. Now what you can see is the people are starting to take on that miniature look, that figurine look, because of how we're kind of changing the perspective and our depth of field. It's giving the illusion of this toy model look like we put these little models down here. Now what we can do is, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my brush tool. I'm going to look at my mask first, and I'm under the focus brush options, there's a show mask button. And you can see that we have a very, very thin uh, plane of focus, which is fine. I'm okay with that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to drop my feathering, and I'm going to bring my uh, brush opacity up to 100%. I'm going to decrease the size of the brush. And I'm going to just make sure that I paint on certain things and in, by doing that, if I paint on this person here, I'm snapping this person into focus. I'm going to snap this person into focus. And I'm just doing little strokes around the person. I don't want to go too far outside of them. But what it's doing is it's bringing them more into definition. I'll get this person here. I'll get this person. And then what, what that's doing is it's kind of making them look uh, even more like figurines. I'm also going to uh, brush this little uh, the parking sign just to make sure that we don't get a parking ticket um, and I'm trying to see if there are any other people that I need to take care of not really what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna drop the opacity of this brush significantly maybe even to about 30 percent and I'm just gonna draw along the edge of this sidewalk because I want to have a little bit wider uh, plane of focus And this will kind of give a little bit more, um, it will lend a little bit more uh, reality to the scene. Because I, the, that yellow, this yellow part over here that was blurred, I kind of like having that a little bit more in focus. Uh, the little uh, paint over here that the util uh, one utility company must have uh, drawn down here, I want that in focus. Because all those little things add to reality. Now I'm going to bring my opacity back up. I'm going to paint this little guy right here, this little sign. You see, for, think about it. This is just a mobile shot, just a, a shot I took with my camera phone. But look at what we're able to do just with using the same tools, again, that you would uh, normally use for um, a much, much more, uh, a higher quality or a higher megapixel image. And so I'm just kind of getting all these little shapes here. I want to get the, the, the pole here for the sign. I want to get this entire area here in focus. I'm going to make my brush a little narrower because I want the top of the uh, pole, this lamppost. I want this to be in focus because it's on the same plane. Now you will notice that we painted a little bit of blur or a little bit of focus in an area that we didn't want. So what I can do is I can change my fo uh, mode from paint focus to paint blur, drop the opacity significantly, um, and then just kind of paint blur back here. And keep layering that until um, it blends in a little bit better. So I'm just kind of painting that area here. Because I, I don't want the wall of that uh, church to uh, be in focus. I just want the lamppost to be in focus. OK. Now what we can also do is we can drop the brightness of when you adjust the brightness and the contrast under the options palette here, so you've got brightness and contrast, they, uh, they um, affect the areas that are out of focus. They're not affecting this plane over here that we painted in focus. W the reason why we do that is by dropping the brightness, say, and boosting the contrast. So we drop the brightness and we can boost the con contrast. That further aids in bringing your eye to this focal point. We're darkening the surrounding areas of the bug. So there's, there's a method to the madness here. I also want to, you see, I'm, I'm looking at little things here. I'm going to go back to my brush. I'm going to change from paint blur to paint focus. I want to get the little feet of this sign. This is where 
having a little bit of OCD actually helps because um, you you know you attack these little things and it just you know adds to the credibility of the scene. Now we're going to hit um, actually I'm gonna, and now I'm also going to paint back a little bit of blur um, here. I'm not happy with the blending that I did here. Okay, now we can hit um, apply. Let's um, let focal point do its magic. So now we've kind of added this, but we're not done yet. Um, when I see this scene, I'm, I kind of, for some reason, I, there are certain scenes of movies that pop into my mind. Um, like there are certain scenes in Harry Potter. Um, I can't remember what the thing was, but he uh, he goes into his memories with with Dumbledore into this uh, little water this. A pool of water, and I can't remember, like some sieve, I think it was called. I can't remember, but um, the effect in the movies of him traveling through memories, uh, for some reason, this scene evokes that uh, memory for me. So, what I'm going to do is we're going to go into Photo Tools now, and I'm going to show you how I'm going to uh, use Photo Tools to overall change the look of the scene. So, we use Focal Point to recreate a tilt shift look, and now we're going to go here. I'm going to go to the black and white treatments, and I'm going to use. Um, Let's try Kev's Secret Formula by Kevin Kubota. Let's add it to the stack. And this gets me to where I want to go. The pensive, thank you, Mayra, the pensive. That's what it's called in Harry Potter. I knew someone from the audience would, would hook me up with the correct answer. <laughs> Rock on. So here we go. We've got um, this very, very cool, now we're getting this ethereal kind of dreamlike feel because of this effect. And I'm going to leave it at 100% because I want everything around the focal point to just go dark. What I will do, and this was this normally goes against the grain. Uh, for those of you that maybe attended my black and white um, webinars that we did, uh, I think last month or the month prior, I am not normally a fan of isolated color or selective color. What does that mean? A selective color in a black and white image is, let's say you take um, a black and white image of yellow tulips. You convert the whole image to black and white, and then you restore the yellow color of the tulips only. To me, that always screams, I shouldn't say always, because I don't like making blanket statements, but um, it kind of, it, it's kind of tacky. I, I, you have to really have stones to, to pull that off really well. But I do think in this image here, because the whole image is so kind of, I don't know, desaturated or, or monotone, a little bit of selective color might help here. So to get selective color, what we're going to do is we're going to use this brush. Now in Focal Point, the brush that we used was a focus brush. In Photo Tools, the brush is called a masking brush. And we've got our black and white Kev Seeker formula effect stacked right here, and below it is the color image. So if I take my masking brush and I select the option to paint out, meaning paint out the secret formula effect, we'll drop the opacity to about 60%, and with a very small brush, I'm just going to start painting in on our little figurines. And what that's doing is with each stroke I'm doing here, it's bringing back some of their color from their original layer. And in this particular case, I think that it really does help because um, the, the, they're so small, um, and they have they each are wearing some uh, you know different colored outfits that it helps bring up, pop them off of the scene. Now we can kind of boost up the opacity and just bring a little bit more color into them, especially the the ones that are wearing this person's wearing some sort of a. Let me see if we hide the layer, kind of like a beige coat almost, and this person's wearing blue. This person's wearing a black coat with blue jeans. So now that this is looking pretty cool, I think. Um, so we can hit apply. We didn't even, you see, we didn't even do that much. What we can also do, let's say you want to um, darken everything here except for the um, sidewalk. Here's a cool little trick. If we go to the, uh, where is it, the lighting effects. And then we go to the dynamic light, and I've used this in webinars before, except I've never done this. If we go to dark and planar, so you see this little icon here. This is a, a, a masking bug. When I add the dark and planar to the stack, it's going to add a planar bug, just like you remember in focal point, except that this is a masking bug. Anything inside of the bug will be darker. So watch what we're going to do. We're going to put it over the sidewalk here. 
and then what it's doing now is it's actually darkening the sidewalk, but we don't want that. We want it to darken everything but the sidewalk. So if we hit the invert mask button, it does the opposite. It darkens everything outside of um, the, the bug. Now what we're free to do is kind of adjust. Oh wait, let me invert it again. Oh, it is darkening, so there we go. Um, so you can see kind of what it's doing, and we can, if it's too narrow, we can bring it out a bit. But that does another job of kind of bringing focus towards the center here. And you can see here's our original image. Let's, uh, let's again, Command or Control E, or actually you don't even have to do that. You see this None button? If you hit None, that'll hide the palette on the, to, to the bottom, and if you hit Command or Control Zero, it'll bring the image to full screen, so it'll make it a little bit easier for you to see. So here's the image. This is our original image. And this is our image with the, the photo tool set. So this is kind of a, a way to um, really bring out some unique look to the, to the shot. So I'm going to hit apply over here. <laughs> and Photoshop crashed. <laughs> See, we are not, because we do these webinars, it, I'm not exempt from Photoshop crashes. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, we just lost everything that we did, but that's okay because that was the end of that image. So let's, um, let's go to this next image here. <clears throat> yeah, that was, that, was, that was perfect timing. <laughs> no, James, I don't think it crashed yesterday. It, uh, Photoshop crashed a few days ago. Uh, it wasn't yesterday, though. Um, at least I don't remember it crashing. I like to block those things out of memory. So here we go. Let's. We've got. I'm going to give you different ideas now of what we just did. Was we used uh, photo tools and focal point on an image that was taken with a five megapixel camera, where half my body was hanging out of uh, my, my good buddy's office window. Nothing special. I would expect that if everyone. Yeah. Thank you very much, Adobe. I appreciate it. Problem description. Your product crashed in the middle of my webinar with several hundred attendees. Way to go. Include email address. Sure. Submit it. Okay. So there we go. Um, I would I would hope that if you're if you have access to a you know a high enough elevation uh, hanging out a window being safe of course no one here at on one wants you to fall out of a window but if you can kind of hang out of a window and get a cool shot from above you can easily recreate that look the key to a good tilt shift look and I brought this up before to get the miniature toy model look the key to it is to get a higher vantage point of your subject. If I was standing on street level with these people and I shot them head on, the effect would not be nearly as exaggerated. But because I was above them, it really makes it pop. Okay. So here, um, this is my colleague, my friend. This is the uh, the manager of our uh, customer service and technical support teams. His name is uh, Patrick Smith. He's a good guy. And uh, when we were at Photoshop World, after we were done, we kind of rewarded ourselves with golf. And uh, this was actually my very first time in my entire life playing golf. So uh, I took this picture of Patrick, um, and I had no nothing to it. I just wanted to take a picture of him swinging. Um, and what's funny is that I have, I think, uh, Marie's on the phone, and Marie is a part of our support team. So I hope you get a kick out of this, Marie. Um, so what what's the point of this image here well for the most part I'm happy with the image um, we can do some things to get rid of the um, this cart here we can get rid of uh, what I think is a spare ball or oh, no you know what? that's Patrick's ball he, I don't know if he missed it or he was just taking a practice swing um, but that's not that's not even it what I want to do is I want to take this sky um, and I want to replace it with the sky over here using mask pro now this sky over here was taken with my iPhone. I do this very, very often. Believe it or not, um, it's a great 
method to just getting a, a library of skies. Your sky doesn't have to be extremely high quality. It doesn't need to be, you know, 21 megapixels. This 5 megapixel image is more than enough. You can see the resolution here. Um, plenty of resolution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, and you're right, Mayor, they, I'm going to bring that up in a minute, how, you, how we can use the iPhone for other uh, tools. So let's take both of these images and let's send them over to uh, Photoshop. And I see questions here, guys, and I will address them. Uh, one, let's, let's go through this image first, and I'll address the questions. Okay, so one of the first things I will do here, watch, if we zoom in on this image, you will see that there is a lot of noise. That's um, just one of the things about mobile phone photography. Um, you can see all that noise. That's fine, you know, that's okay. Um, what I will do in this he image here is I'm going to actually apply a noise reduction filter. So I told you I use Topaz Labs uh, Denoise 5. I, I like this product for noise reduction. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try, this is a JPEG image, so I'm going to use one of their presets here. Uh, I'm going to go between light and moderate. I want to see which one. Okay, so moderate does a nice job of kind of cleaning up that noise, and I'm going to hit OK. So I'm just running a quick noise reduction over, overlay on top of the image just to kind of cut into that noise. I want the clouds to have a little bit of a smoother look. So we're going to let this process. Let's see what it does. Okay, so it does a nice job. Uh, if we zoom in again, the noise is definitely reduced. It's, it's uh, smoothed out. I'm going to go to our original image of Patrick over here, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hit Command J or Control J, and that will duplicate the background. You don't have to do that. I'm just doing that because I don't want to turn the background into its own layer. Go back to the sky image, go to Select All, and then with my Move tool, which is the first tool on the Photoshop toolbar, I'm going to drag it here onto the first image. The key here is before I let go, guys, I'm going to press and hold on the Shift key. I'm holding the shift key, I let go, and what that does is it kind of uh, pastes the image uh, onto the, um, to fit the, the underlying layer. Um, Karen's asking why use Topaz instead of Photoshop. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I just, I don't know. I like, uh, you know what, I do like the output of Topaz. Truthfully, I've always been a lover of Noiseware Pro by Imagenomic. Um, I use them for years, but these guys don't feel that it's necessary to make a 64-bit compile of their product for the Mac. In all of their infinite wisdom, they released a product for Windows, but they didn't release it for the Mac at the same time. When we released our suite, our perfect photo suite for 64-bit, it was Mac and Windows on the same day, and it was within, I think, two months of Photoshop CS5 coming out. It's been a year, I think, maybe over over a year since Photoshop's been out, and I still can't use this product. So I actually have to go and buy another product to use 64-bit noise reduction. So that I hope that answers the question. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of this product. Once ImageNomic comes out with their uh, Noiseware Pro for 64-bit for Mac, I'll switch back to that because I was really, really happy with that. Okay. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this list. So we've got, we can say here, this layer we'll call Patrick. This layer we'll call Sky. Oops. I don't just do this too often, renaming my layers, but um, I think that for the webinar it's easier just so that we can visualize. I'm going to put Patrick on top of the sky. And then what I'm going to do temporarily to position the sky is I'm going to drop the opacity of, Pat of the Patrick layer. And so what you're going to start seeing is you're going to start seeing the sky through uh, the Patrick layer. I'm going to go to the sky. I'm going to go to Edit and then go to tra uh, Free Transform. And then I'm going to squish the sky. I'm just going to drag it straight up because I actually like con the look that the of condensing the clouds here. It, it looks like it's more populated with clouds. And so I'm going to just bring it to about here, maybe bring it up a little bit more. Okay. And now I'm going to hit this checkbox to commit the free transform. Now I can go to my uh, Patrick layer, bring uh, the layer back up to um, 100% and I'm going to create a layer mask. So the layer mask will separate 
uh, will, will display um, anything that I want to paint out from the Patrick layer, and it'll display the sky layer, which you can see right here. Now I'm going to go into uh, Mask Pro, and let's let's work on Mask Pro. I'll go to Window, Zoom Window, so that we can get rid of the, distra the distractions. I'm going to move uh, the palettes out of the way so that we don't have anything over our image. And now we can start um, working on uh, the image here. I'm going to start with um, just getting rid of the majority of the sky. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to outline the foreground. So kind of like right above the tree line. I'm going to get as close as I can. I'm just kind of outline this area here. Now with my bucket tool, I'm going to click on top of the sky and we've gotten a big part of our, uh, you know, a large chunk of the sky has uh, now been, uh, is now being displayed. And you can see now how it's looking pretty cool. Next, I'm going to take my keep dropper. So the whole, um, the crux of Mask Pro is that it uses color as its bias to differentiate between what you want to protect on your mask and what you want to remove. So we've got these two droppers. The left dropper here is a keep dropper and the right dropper is called the drop dropper. The keep dropper will select colors you want to protect. So I want to protect these various uh, colors of the tree. So we've got this tree line here. Then I want to protect uh, Patrick's hand because we're going to be masking through the hand. I'm going to zoom in a bit and I'm going to select the golf club now, here's an important point. I can already tell we might have some trouble. You see the color we selected of the club? As you add colors, um, you'll see the um, you'll see the colors be, ad be added to the respective palette. I can see that this club what is reflective. You see, you can kind of see blue here. Now watch what happens if I select the colors to remove. I'm going to select these various blues around. They're somewhat similar, so we might have a little bit of masking uh, removed out of the club, and I'm okay with that because I can fix that. But now what I want to do is I want to kind of continue on selecting the colors to protect. So let's zoom out, out here. Okay, I think that's good. Let me zoom out more just to make sure that I have everything. Get that dirt over there. Alright, now to, the colors to remove are going to be these various now this could be a little bit tough because there's a lot of noise in the sky. So maybe I could have run a noise reduction filter, but the noise introduces different colors. And you can see them here. Alright, when I've got my color selected, I'm going to use this magic brush. The magic brush will actively compare the colors to protect against the colors to remove. And so I can just draw and you can see how it's keeping the tree line. Now there's a little bit of a fuzz uh, around the tree line and I'm not worried about that and I'll show you how to combat that in a second. What I want to do is just kind of paint through and get the majority of the tree line out of the way. Paint right through Patrick's arm, did a beautiful job of restoring that. Let's paint through the club, no problem there. The top of the club kind of is blending in with the sky. Let's just finish this up. Let's get this area down here. And this little tiny piece right there, right there. And I think we're good. All right. So the first thing I want to do is see what my mask is giving me. So if I hit three, or no, I actually forget that. Let's go to view mode and go to mask, which is number three. It's actually a pretty clean mask. But if we zoom in, there are a few things that we're, we see here. First, you see how the club itself has a little bit of uh, gray and black in it? that means that we painted that out. So to restore that, I can go to the flat brush, which is to the right of the magic brush. I'm going to change the mode. So most every tool here has these two boxes. And if you're familiar with Photoshop, it's reminiscent of your foreground and background colors. Except in Mask Pro, they're not foreground and background colors. It's uh, remove and restore. So remove is signified by this uh, transparent checker box. Restore is signified by this solid gem color. Restore means paint back in. Remove means paint out. 
So in this case, I want to paint in. I, I, we actually painted out of Patrick's arm. He wouldn't be too thrilled with me for that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit my restore button. I'm going to drop the brush size really small, and I'm going to paint that in, this entire area. I'm also going to paint the club in as well. Let me bring my um, hardness up. Oops. I brought it too soft. There we go. Actually, I want to make it totally hard. Bring it small. All right. And just kind of get this area in here. I want to be very, very fine with um, with my brush size because I don't want to paint in. I don't want to paint the sky back. Now you can also see that there are kind of some spots over here. That means that we um, we need to kind of paint the uh, sky out. So we go to the same flat brush. We change from restore to remove. Let's bring our um, brush size up a bit. And let's just paint this out, just this area here. We'll just clean it up a bit. I remember it didn't look very bad at all. That It wasn't really noticeable, but it doesn't hurt to just kind of tidy up a bit. Now if we want, what we can also do is we can kind of refine our drop selection. So if we select the drop dropper again, and we select these areas that have little gray spots and go back to our magic brush, it'll actually refine the selection on the fly and it'll help out. So now let's go, um, let's zoom out. Let's go to view, mode, and composite. Or maybe we'll just hit five there. There we go. All right. So you can see that there's a little bit of a halo or a fuzz around the um, around the tree line. One of the ways to combat that is by using the magic chisel. So the magic chisel is to the left of the blur tool. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the brush size up. And I'm just going to paint along the tree line here. Just draw literally right across it. And what it's doing is it's shaving off one pixel from the edge. And that one pixel is that actual transition. So you can see how that halo is being removed. Just going to continue on through the tree line here. And what that does is it adds a little bit of, of a seamless feel to the background. So the mask now looks totally natural. And so if we hit File and then go Save, Apply, Mask Pro will build the mask for us. It looks great. Everything looks good. And now we can start working on cleaning up the, uh, the rest of the image. So one of the things you can play around with here is we can use a lasso tool in Photoshop just kind of draw a selection around the ca the cart, the shadow, and then just kind of close it up. And if we go to Edit and then Fill, we can use the Content Aware Fill, which was introduced with Photoshop CS5, and it should analyze the surrounding area. Now, if we deselect, we can kind of see that <laughs> it, it kind of added this weird crater pattern. So we can hit go back to our history, go to our lasso, and we can try other things. We can deselect and we can use a, um, a stamp brush and see how we're good. At, at the very least, let's try to use the stamp brush to kind of uh, clone out the, this, the shadow. And that might give us a little bit better result. For the um, content aware fill. So now that we got rid of, because what, what was happening was the content aware fill started um, sampling from this grass, which is different than the, this grass. So let's go to our masking or lasso again, select this area here, and then go again to edit fill, and let's see if we get a better result. And we do. It's definitely better. So we got rid of that. The rest of the stuff is easy enough to use just a um, spot healing brush. So like the ball here, if you don't want the ball, the random uh, leaves, just to clean up the image. The spot healing brush does a nice job there. Clean up the bunker a bit. 
Okay, so there we go. I mean, to me, this is a much more interesting shot. The sky is much more interesting. First of all, it doesn't have any noise that the original um, uh, the original sky had. If we go to our layers here and we just hide the other layers, you can see the original image. And if we zoom in on the sky, you can see all this noise over here. It's it's riddled with noise. Let me just wait for the screen to catch up. See all that noise. But now if we um, show the other layers, it's much nicer. Paul asks a great question. Can the sky be easily lightened or darkened after being masked in? Sure. If you go to the sky layer here and say add a uh, and go to the adjustments palette. So if you don't have the adjustments palette, go to window and then select adjustments. And then we add a levels adjustment. We can kind of adjust the level so we can brighten the sky up and it's only affecting that layer. We can boost the, the uh, black point of the sky and we can kind of adjust the overall brightness or darkness. We can also um, add another adjustment layer uh, for saturation. And so let's say we go to the blue channels here and we drop the saturation down, you can see how the, the sky is getting a little um, more subdued. Or if you want it to go crazy, you just bring up the saturation. But no one likes that much craziness in their life. So let's just bring it up a bit. And the nice thing about adjustment layers is I can always come back here by clicking on the layer and then uh, revive. Let's say I want to boost the white point up more and I want to make it brighter. Or I want to make it darker, you know? however you want it. What we can also do is now we can go to this layer here, the Patrick layer, we can go to the saturation um, and we can go to the greens and we can boost the saturation of the greens. So now we have a really nice colorful image. And then I can go here, I can uh, hit this, what we call the, I call it the crazy command. It's command, option, shift, E, or control, alt, shift, E. I'm going to have to type that out probably. Um, and what that does is it creates a new layer of all the visible layers underneath it without merging them. You see how all the layers are still here, but we now have this kind of snapshot layer. Let me just let me just type it out because it's gonna it's it's a big command. So on the mat, it's called this is called um, stamp visible in Photoshop. See yes, uh, just Photoshop. On a Mac, it's uh, command plus option plus shift plus E on the PC, and I'll make the font size bigger in a second. Control plus Alt plus shift plus E. Biggin, embiggin, there we go. So write this down. This is a great command to have. Um, I actually bind this command on my Wacom tablet um, in Photoshop. So I have a, a button that will automatically run this shortcut key. So it just creates this shortcut for me. But so here's my point, the reason why I said that. Now I have this new layer. I can go into the On One palette. Let's go into Photo Tools. And I'm going to add a little bit of a vignette. So we can go to um, Edge Treatments, Edge Vignette Dark. Um, let's do Masking Bug Normal. No, it's Masking Bug Overlay. No, Normal. Add the stack. Here's our little circular bug. Kind of create a nice um, shape. And then we can drop that so that it's not so strong just a very subtle mask and uh, what else can we do let's uh, let's add a rainbow so let's go here type it we'll go to the search key type in rainbow we'll do uh, upper right at the stack okay so there's our rainbow um, but the rainbow is let's go to our bug here and let's rotate it until so that it's like that. There we go. And now what we can do is we can take our masking brush, paint out 100%. Let's paint it out of the entire foreground. Let's paint it out of the tree line. 
but you can see how we're having fun. You know, it's just there's <laughs> nothing wrong with having a little fun with photo tools. That's what, that's part of the reason why we built it. Kind of paint it out over here, and we can drop it if it's too strong. Kind of just just the tiniest, faintest look of. Is there a way to reposition the rainbow? Uh, that's a good question. I think let's see if we take the mask. No, that moves the whole, or the hand, that moves the whole image. I don't think, let's see, with the bug, if we move the bug, no, the bug doesn't really adjust the positioning. So the, you see here these sub options. You've got upper left, upper center, upper right, left. So really it's it's static to the position of the image. But, you know, to me this is okay, actually. So let's um let's bring it up, make it a little bit stronger. Okay, hit apply. Let's see if Photoshop will crash again. No, it didn't. Oh, wait, 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 we're not done yet. You can't change the shape of the rainbow, uh, Sharon. It's only, uh, and it's good to see you, Sharon. Um, you can only have it in this circular pattern. But that looks kind of cool. I'm going to actually save this and send this to Patrick. Um, just kind of take a brush. Let's say, wish you were here. Okay, now we can save that to the desktop as a JPEG final. And we'll go high quality for Patrick. Cool. All right, so that's um, how you can use Mask Pro. Just uh, and the whole thing was because I used my phone to get this picture of this cool sky. That's all that was uh, to it. Okay, let's go to another image. So I want to do this one. Let me see. Oh, this is a cool one. All right. So this image was um, I took this a couple of weeks ago um, in, uh, in Madison Square Garden. It was the Knicks versus the Celtics. And unfortunately, the Knicks decided to blow it in the last quarter, which is a huge bummer. Um, so after the game was over, and we had awesome seats, we were sitting right over here. Spike Lee was right here, and it was kind of cool. And Whoopi Goldberg was there too. Um, now you might be wondering, well, how did you get this look? This is a fisheye lens on my phone. Um, I'm going to show you at the end of the webinar these two add-on lenses that I got for my phone and they work, they supposedly work on any phone, camera phone. You will guarantee you this will be one of the best 40 bucks you'll ever spend for these lenses. This instantly, I mean I, I've gone on shoots where I just use these add-on lenses with my iPhone um, and I've gotten some awesome results. So let's go here and let's go bring this image into um, Photoshop and I think you can see where I'm going to go with this. We're definitely going to give this a little focal point love and what I want to do is create that tilt shift look on the this plane of focus here of the court. One of the nice things about using focal point here is it'll also help reduce the sky or reduce the sky, it'll reduce the noise in the ceiling. So let's go into focal point and I'll show you really quickly because I actually want to do another image and I want to show you a tip that um, so many people use, or I know a lot of photographers use, but I don't think a lot of people know how they get there, and I want to share it. I'm going to give away the barn today. Let's put our um, focus bug here. We'll change it from round to planar, and let's just change the uh, plane of focus so that it's um, kind of over the court. Next, we're going to again put the cursor in the middle of or in the body of the bug, hit the alter option key, and change the plane of focus so it's kind of parallel to the court. I'm going to drop my uh, feathering because I want it to be somewhat of a um, abrupt transition from in focus to out of focus. Actually, I'm going to make it a little bit less of a, or more of a feather. All right. Now, there are a few things I'm going to do. First, I'm going to change my lens profile. Uh, to use to simulate a 35 millimeter lens. So I'm going to go to the lens uh, section here, go down to Canon 35 at 1.4. And what that does is it changes the qualities of the bokeh area. And drop the amount a little bit. I don't need that much blur. Maybe a little bit more. But I'm going to use the highlight bloom to pop the specular highlights. So you can see how it's getting really cool. 
Next, I'm going to go back to my uh, focus brush and I'm going to start painting focus in on certain areas. Like I want to make sure that the tops of these people's heads are in focus. So I'm just kind of drawing. I want to make sure that the uh, backboard is in focus because the backboard is on the same plane of focus as the court. Uh, I want this backboard to be in focus as well. And so by using a small brush, I'm kind of giving myself um, kind of a more of a precise selection. Just kind of paint these guys here. Everything that's on the court, not horizontally, but vertically on the Y plane needs to be in focus. By doing this, by doing these little kind of tedious things, you're really adding credibility to your shot. You're making the shot make sense visually. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to drop the brightness to darken everything, boost the contrast. We're also going to add a little bit of a vignette in uh, focal point to uh, burn the edges. So what, what all this is doing is it's helping draw um, focus to the center court. And what I might do is bring my highlight bloom up even more. I really want that all, the, all those uh, specular highlights to pop. Now this is looking like a scene out of a movie. And it was taken with an iPhone. All right, let's hit apply. And then let's go into photo tools and we'll just kind of bring out the court area here. Um, so let's go here. We'll go to photo tools. And what can we do here? Let's add gold now enhancer right off the bat. Just, oh, oh, I think I'm just going to add that. We'll go to um, stylized effects, go to gold now enhancer because I want to warm up the court. Uh, get to strength that we like. invert the mask, and then paint it in just on the cord. So we just warm the cord up. And then um, I think that's good, right? I mean, there's, let's, let's hide the uh, panel. That looks pretty good. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to fix things up. I'm going to hit Apply. Let Focal Point or Photo Tools do its thing. Did Photo Tools add something? Oh, it did. Okay, cool. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, use my uh, spot healing brush. And I'm just going to get rid of certain things. Like, I want that gone. That's too distracting. I want the specular highlights to really focus up above. So I'm just going to kind of go here, get rid of some of these guys. And that's looking pretty good. I might add a little bit more of a vignette, but I'm happy with this overall. So here's our original image. Let's just hide the other layers. And then this is uh, what we were able to do with focal point. And so um, I don't want you guys to think that the perfect photo suite is this, you know, is too good for mobile phone photography. This is important that you understand that your images that you take with your camera phone can produce some amazing results. All right, let's go to this image here. Where, where was it? Was it this one? Oh, that's my dog, Chaka. I was going to work on that, but we'll do that for the uh, next session. And the reason, okay, so the reason why I included these, this is the kind of shot that you probably would take with your camera phone. I was out in my, this is my backyard. I, I just kind of kneeled down. Chaka was sitting there. She was a good girl. I took a picture of her. Um, and I, I, I used focal point and photo tools to kind of bring out the image to kind of, uh, right now the sky is blown out um, and, you know, um, I want focal point will help reduce that. But let's go to this image here. So I took this image um, over the winter. This was taken in uh, this, this farm pond. For those of you that live in the um, Framingham area of Massachusetts, this was farm pond. It was, a, I couldn't ask for better timing in terms of this perfect storm rolled in, uh, enough storm, the, uh, this fog rolled in uh, as a storm was approaching. So I'm going to show you a quick trick in Photoshop here on how to give your clouds movement. First, before I do anything, I'm going to get rid of distractions. I'm going to mask this out. I'm not masking it, rather. I'm using a spot healing brush, just getting rid of these uh, little divots. I'm also going to close this hole up. Okay, that's this works for me now. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to I want to give the cloud motion. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use my lasso tool and I'm just going to draw 
Um, actually, before I do that, let me deselect. Let me duplicate this layer. Okay, now I'm going to draw. Uh, just kind of getting close to the horizon line here. And I had too much coffee, so my hand is not, not steady. And I'm just going to draw around the whole outside of the image to cl close that up. There we go. Okay, so check this out, guys. If we go to um, Filter, Blur, Radial Blur. Okay, there are a few things that we have to do. First, importantly, we have to change our blur method from spin to zoom. I also change my quality from good to best. Now, here's another important thing. The first important thing is the blur method. Next is the center. So it's hard from, I'm going to try to explain this to you um, as best as I can. This controls the directionality of the blur. So look at this, um, the clouds. I think you'll agree with me that the clouds are moving from top left through the frame towards uh, to bottom right, right? It's kind of, you can see the clouds are kind of moving in this, you know, kind of like this. Um, let's hit cancel. Like clouds are moving kind of this way. So let's um, let's go again to filter blur, radial blur. Do zo uh, zoom best. Now the directionality basically, if this is the center. What I'm going to do is I want the center to come kind of up here. So you can see that the blur, you are doing the same direction of the blur from top left to bottom right. I'm going to bring the amount up to about 17%. Uh, now let's hit OK. And you see what it does, it adds kind of a motion blur to the shot. And you can see that it treats the top left as the center, meaning this has the least amount of motion, and then it starts motioning out. Now if if you don't like this or if you want more or less or you want to change the, the center point, just undo, go back to filter, blur, radial blur, and one thing we can do is kind of bring the center um, kind of more to the center here, bring maybe the amount up a bit and then let's hit OK again. Now I don't like this because the center is over here. So again, undo, and this is very much a, a, an experimentation process, but I've used this uh, effect many times in my shots. It works best when you've got um, a lot of clouds because it simulates a, a dragged exposure. So let's put the shutter more towards uh, the center, more towards the upper left, or kind of a little bit lower, like there, and we'll hit OK. Okay, that's looking pretty cool. Um, now what we can do is, let's see, I, if I have a selection made, I wonder if I go to my um, adjustments and I go to the levels, if I bring up the white point, is it adjusting the whole image? No, it's just, I think just the, oh wait, I didn't grab it. Okay, it's just it's doing the selection, cool. So let's bring the white point to where the white point starts. Let's bring the black point, that's way too much. Yeah, I don't like that whatsoever because it's adding, you, you could see this discrepancy here. So that's not a problem. What we're going to do is let's undo, let's go to our history here, let's go to our um, radial blur, let's deselect. Now what we're going to do to help blend this line over here, let's go to our uh, noise reduction. So let's go here, filter, we'll do noise reduction. What that'll help do is blend in uh, the rest. You see how there's all this noise here? Well, let's wait for, the, there we go. Now there's more of a blend, so we're going to hit OK. Topaz do its thing. I think Topaz is a pretty uh, reasonably priced uh, noise reduction tool. If you go to topazlabs.com, I think they're good enough. I mean, they do it. I'm happy with the job it does. All right, so we can do other things here, like we can use um, a the spot healing brush and just kind of draw along the edge here. Oops, I drew over the cloud line. But the point is you can start blending a little bit. Here there's not as much of a problem. It's mostly isolated to over here where there's um, we need to blend a little bit. But now that it's blended and we can again I would work on this more if I was if this was a production shot, but for now, for these purposes, I think you're getting what I'm what I'm doing. Now we can go into photo tools. And there are a few things I want to do here.
what are our categories. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a golden hour enhancer to bring out the um, warmth of the sun. So we'll go to stylized effects and then we'll go to golden hour enhancer. Add that to the stack. I'm going to drop the strength down a little bit, bring it up, and then I'm going to invert the mask and then paint it in um, just here. Actually, let me undo that. I want to bring my strength, the opacity of the brush down. I don't want it to be that abrupt. And so I'm just going to draw strips here. And you can see how it's kind of coming out nicely. Now, to complement that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the cyberpunk effect. Actually, you know what? I won't do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the tinting options. Let me see what if I add a blue tint to the image, if that'll help complement it. Mm, not as much. All right, let's add, let's remove that and let's do a search for um, cool. Let's add this cooling filter that we see here. Let's add that to the stack. That's better. That's much better. So what we're going to do is I'm going to keep this pretty much at 100%. I'm going to use my masking brush to paint out, and I'm going to restore that warmth. And that's too abrupt. So let me undo this. Let me bring the opacity down and just so that we have a nice transition. That's looking pretty good. And then I might add a just enough darkness uh, effect to bring out the shadow. So let's go to stylized effects. Go to just enough darkness. Let's see what it does here. I might just include it in the foreground. Actually, I like it in the whole image. Now you can see it's bringing out a little bit more of the discrepancy here, so we have to blend that after we hit apply, but that's something that you can do uh, on your own. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I might do here. I might, let's see if we go to um, a neutral density. Let's do, um, actually, go, go to categories, go to um, photo filters, and then let's just do a graduated neutral density. We'll do the upper, we'll do the ha a half mark at the stack. What did I do? Why isn't it showing up? Hmm, that's weird. All right, let's try that again. Hide mask. Let's see, graduate to neutral density. There we go. Uh, so let's see if I want to darken it above. That's looking pretty good. So here's our original image. Kind of flat. And with photo tools, we brought out some of that color. Hit apply. All right, so let me let me um, go to some of the questions now. I didn't really do much uh, of the Q and A during the session, so let's do it here. Um, can you clone in a divot, <laughs> Frank? I assume with the golf shot. Sure, why not? If you have a good uh, shot of a divot, you definitely could. Um, and I know Gary was saying that I should have moved the ball into the air. I would have done that, but the ball itself was so embedded into the ground that. I, could, I don't think I would have been able to get the grass around. You would have a little bit of grass in the sky. So Bob says I refer to cyberpunk a lot, and I use it a lot. You're absolutely right. I love cyberpunk. Cyberpunk was an effect that our senior product manager, Dan Hollerker, uh, built he, uh, based on the movie uh, Minority Report with Tom Cruise. Um, I think that was a Spielberg movie. And um, it, it has certain scenes have this kind of very cool blue tint to it, and so he literally built an effect around it. And I love it. I, I like um, so I use cyberpunk as my cooling agent. Um, so you you can also say that a lot of times I use golden hour enhancer. That's my warming agent. Um, so I have my my go to with uh, warming and cooling agents: golden hour enhancer and uh, cyberpunk. Now there are warming filters and cooling filters in photo tools. I just happen to like the the, the effects that those two um, those effects give me. So we'll I'll give you the name of that noise reduction filter in a second. Let's see. All right, so let's start with um, would a free transform move the layer? Glenn, that's a good question. Would a free transform move the layer, or the rainbow rather? Would a free transform move the rainbow? No, because if you see here in the layer palette, when Photo Tools comes in, it comes in as a flat layer. So we don't have the ability. Now, 
now, now, now, now, now. Okay, okay, I see what you're saying. Let's try this. Now let's go into Photo Tools again. I'm kind of thinking uh, as I'm doing this, but let's go to Search. We'll go to Rainbow. This could work. Rainbow. All right, we'll add it to the upper right, and we'll do what we did before. Let's just kind of get it ready. We'll use the um, masking bug. We'll kind of rotate it. Okay, just like that. Now let's brush it out at 100% from the foreground. But I think this might work. This might, might, this might be crazy enough to work. It's all about thinking outside of the box. And you know what? I thank you guys. for. I wouldn't have thought of this if this didn't come up now. Of course, if it doesn't work, I take absolutely no responsibility. But if it does work, I take full responsibility. Okay. So here's our rainbow. Let's make it a little bit less. Okay. Uh, maybe a little bit more. Just so it'll come through on the, uh, on the webinar screen. All right. So here we go. Now let's hit apply. So now the rainbow is on its own layer, technically, right? Because we have two photo tools layers. There's the photo tools one and two. So there's the rainbow. Now, if we hit free transform, so Glenn, this might be this might be it. Let's see. So if we move it, oh wait a second, what a bummer. That's moving the whole layer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, let me think. Let's not commit the transform. No, it it uh, what you'd have to do, I think, is mask, create a mask. This this might be a bit crazy. Let's see. Let's invert the layer mask, and then let's use a um, a brush with white, and just where's that rainbow? So here's the rainbow. Now with that, if we do a free transform. So kind of, sort of, you kind of are just moving the rainbow. See how the rainbow is going over here? And then we can kind of rotate it and make it smaller. And then put, we can put it here. Let's stretch it out a bit so that it reaches the horizon. And then we can commit it and then use uh, the brush to remove this information. So it's kind of going to be sloppy. You see what I mean? You'd have to blend the rest of it in, and it's just kind of a mess. I thought that would work. Oh, uh, yeah, we could use the free transform before locking it down. But I don't know how well it'll work because you're going to... I don't think it's a good enough solution. Ooh, create a rainbow on a black background. That can work, too. That could work, too. Let me see. Yeah, so let's... Let's see. Let's do this. Let's create um, a new layer. Fill it with uh, black. And so you're saying if we go to filter and just if we go to photo tools and we do last used, let it do its thing. I'm trying to figure out what the black background will do. Wait a second, why don't we see anything? It's right there. I don't know. I don't. I have to th play with that. Oh, oh, I'm painted in. Oh, hmm. So you're saying? Let's see. Let's. Oops. No, it's this layer here should display if I have a black layer mask. But if I put it up here. I'm missing something. 
No, I don't. I'm gonna let me play around with this, guys, because I think we're onto something. I definitely I see some really good um, ideas here, but I'm I'm wondering if remove layer two. Hmm. This is weird because now my layer is not even displaying. Let me see what my history is. Something happened because even if I go back to my history, we don't even see anything. That is interesting. I wonder what happened, why it's not even showing the image now. Because in theory, I should be able to go back here and just restore my history. That's interesting. Never a dull moment. Yeah, my Photoshop, something is quirking out with my Photoshop, Marcus. Um, in any case, let me see if there are any other questions. Can you use a smart object to re redo your blur? Um, so, Mayor, uh, focal point works as a smart object. You can convert your focal point layer as a smart object, but uh, Photo Tools does not work as a smart object yet. Um, I'm tr oh, so let me go in actually. So let's forget about this for now. We, we can tr play around. I, I want to work on this more for the for the next session of this because I have some other ideas that I want to show you. Let's hide Lightroom. And I'll show you where I got these lenses. All right, so if you go to photojojo.com, I'll put it, let me put it in the uh, chat module so you guys can see the URL. I'll just paint, paste the actual URL to the lens. And so it's this right here. It's 40 bucks for the combination. These little, um, they're these two little lenses. The one on the left has a wide angle adapter, and if you screw it off, it turns into a macro. And then this one on the right is a fisheye. And then they attach by these little magnets. So you can kind of see here, you get these little magnetic adhesives. You put it around the, uh, the uh, hole of your camera lens, and then they just stick on just like that. And they're actually extremely, uh, they, they hold on really nicely. Um, and I cannot, I cannot tell you enough. I can't gush enough. Let me post the URL here so you guys can get it. That's the URL. I honestly, it, I am the macro is unreal when you see just how close this is not an exaggeration you you usually get within an inch or so of um, your subject with macro and the fisheye is fantastic so um, it's 40 bucks for the combination of both of them highly worth it <laughs> 